twenty hundred. I'm going to have my meal at eight, eight o'clock, which is six o'clock your time. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, you can go off then. Yeah. So is John about? Mr. Pooley. There's copyright issues here. I can't broadcast if it's non-UK, so Michael after yeah. you. If you can leave, Mike, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the real reason, he just doesn't like you, but anyway. <laughs> I have, Thank um, you. Uh, Mike, that was uh, that was brilliant. You're making us all jealous. I don't know why you bother with a bloody train set when you got all that around you. <laughs> well said. Because, because John, John, because I need something to do in winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. I mean, you, it's great because the, the sun shines out every day there, isn't it? It's, over here, they all run out. But, no. Uh, yeah. No, the sun doesn't shine every day. Only in the summer. In the summer, but that's too much, isn't it? Every day at 35, 40 degrees, you can soon get fed up with that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I lived in India for three months and I, I certainly learned how to live on the shady side and sit on the shady side of a bus or a train. There's no way you want to be in the sun all the time. No, no we, we, do, we do spend a lot of time in the shade. Whenever we go to the beach, we look for a tree or make sure we can get in the shade. Well, is there no toilets there then? <laughs> hey. Good it's all right. Is there a way for them to finish? Yeah. We're all mates. Anyway, um, thank you again, Mike. Um, I'm going to give you a, a bit of a change. Actually, I was uh, we are in discussion with Paul. I can offer you a, a PowerPoint presentation that uh, I haven't run for about oh, probably about um, five or six years at least now. But it came about as a result of uh, uh, um, me, when I used to be a member of the London Underground Railway Society, um, we had a speaker every month. We used to meet at, um, down in London. And uh, the one time we were there, it was in the winter, I think, and the speaker didn't turn up. And uh, after about 20 minutes, there was no, no knowledge of the speaker. And um, anyway, when they determined he couldn't get there, I think his car had broken down or the train was cancelled or something. They, they wanted people to speak. So they said, uh, my name came in the frame quick. Well, talk about your trains. I said, well, you can't you need to show pictures. And anyway, Roger Chuk, who many of you know, my good mate, Roger, um, put together a framework and that became the basis for this presentation, which uh, we trawled around in quite a few places and uh, offered it. But uh, anyway, there we go. That was the birth of it. Um, I'll just get to um, where we are. I used to go to those meetings. Yeah, they were they were good. They were good. I got fed up because they did nothing for modellers. No, it's a very well. It's it's a niche thing, isn't it? I mean, to this day, commercially, you know, the amount of people who ring me and say, "Oh, uh, why don't they make an underground train?" I said, "Well, commercially, it's a waste of time." Yeah, but Batman, uh, the S stops around. I said, "Yeah, but it took them years to get rid of them all." And um, only the museum, you know, did it and commissioned it. And TfL won't be commissioning anything else nowadays because, of course, they're being funded by the government. So uh, those days are gone. But um, yeah, it's too niche. It's too specialist. Anyway, um, I was going to talk about how I got into model trains because I'm sure you've all got stories about how we ended up in the model train world in this sad, sad world. Um, how I particularly got into the underground and um, how it became a business, which is, I'm now winding down in retirement, but for many years it was uh, quite successful and quite uh, profitable. Um, there's a picture on the screen, I'm sure you can all see, of our um, my uh, previous layout, Abbey Road, many of you may have seen it, two levels, and um, you've got on there a mixture of some of the trains that we uh, made in etched brass, the top level. You've got an EFE, second from the uh, right hand side and one of my early in fact my first uh, attempt and they were made up in India believe it or not that little silver one on the right that was white metal and etched brass but that was a, a design failure but I knew very little about it then anyway there we are I started as a kid that's my first train set the good old tin plate and um, I was running that around and uh, that set that set me going and of course, anywhere we went where you had trains, I think that was at Worthing. There used to be a railway at Worthing and my uncle and auntie lived down there. And there I am staring at that wonderful Western, um, absolutely transfixed. Uh, everywhere you went in the old days of steam in Sri Lanka, um, you'd go and ride on steam engines and do all sorts of things for a packet of cigarettes or whatever, which was wonderful. And like most of you, being able to 
whip around in different places on trains. Mainly, I've got a bit of a, won't go into it, but uh, an affinity to Sri Lanka and India and um, even Japan on one occasion. Well, when I was 40, quite unexpectedly and surprisingly, I managed to get to drive a train. That's not a very good picture, but there I am in the cab on a Northern Line 1995 stock. And uh, the inset is a, a copy of my duty book. And that was the first duty I was given on the, the Saturday, the 15th of October, 2002. And that was a horrible shift. And I'm sure Mike, who's cooking, will, will uh, agree that, I don't know about on the main line, but uh, an eight hour shift, as you can see that duty length is, was one that no one on, no driver on the underground would ever want to get. They wanted the snits, whereas it was a shift arrangement, you had to do eight hour shifts every now and then. But there was three round trips on that shift. So much as it was fun the first time round, um, after that, I soon learned that you didn't want eight-hour shifts. Yeah, John, that is a horrible shift. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, there we are. I always love this cartoon. I think it sums <laughs> up the way the public looked at the drivers. This was from the Evening Standard, a blower cartoon. And you've got the driver with his giving the old two-finger salute and the front car full of money bags and all the suits on the city branch, which I used to see all the time, uh, making comments about the train. Because the suits on the city branch used to use their fancy shoes in their briefcases to trap the doors because they knew you couldn't move the train if the doors weren't uh, proved closed so they were they were rascals on the city branch they were pain in the neck anyway my first train the classic jinty my dad bought me that little trying hornby jinty run it around on the floor on a free before bit of plywood soon got all dusty and didn't run and lone star i uh, remember my mum used to take us to the park and we lived in palmer's green and they were actually made, some of you may know that Lone Star was a factory in Palmer's Green and that's where they made them. And they had another place at Hatfield. And uh, when we used to walk to the park, there was a showroom next near to the factory. And I used to always force her to walk across the road and watch the Baby Deltic and the Class 24 running around with their rubber band drives. But I always wanted one. And uh, probably that's the only collectible item I've got is a mint condition Lone Star train set in uh, mint condition and there's an example of their catalogue but of course an early form of n-scale but it was either on or off there was no control a bit like a lima loco really <laughs> anyway every year how did i get into the underground well every year mum and dad would pay we as a family the five of us would go to the london palladium for the pantomime and it the biggest the best thing for me was the pantomime was brilliant but even better was the fact that we used to go down on the Piccadilly line and I think on the Bakerloo line. So we used to get on the 59s and I remember the red trains, which were lovely. So when a red train come, it was always very exciting. That smell, the whoosh of the train coming in the tunnel, the noise, just the sounds and sights of the underground. But of course, being, a, being at school, I didn't, although we were close to Bounds Green and Wood Green stations, I didn't use the underground because I could walk to school. So it was a special treat. So the seeds were sown there. And particularly the seeds were sown at Southgate um, Swimming Pool. And there's a map there. You can see at the bottom is Southgate Tube Station, mid-centre bottom. And you've got the Piccadilly line in the open there, of course, coming north or going towards Oakwood. And what I'd worked out was that we used to go every Saturday. My dad used to take my sister and I swimming. Well, I couldn't swim and I hated it because I, I tried to drown myself at school. And then with a Baruka that I managed to get to last for about four years, which was non-existent, I managed to keep out of going swimming. So I never learned to swim. And dad used to take us every week. And my sister was four years younger and she could swim. But I used to go in for 10 minutes. And my only reason for going was that Beatty's had three model shops on Southgate Circus, the second hand, the new and, and so on. And equally, I worked out that if I went in the pool for 10 minutes and then dried off and went up in the middle of the gallery, guess what? you got a brilliant view of the Piccadilly line on the viaduct. So I sit there for hours watching the trains go backwards and forwards and poor old dad and my sister could have drowned and I wouldn't have noticed. Southgate, what an interesting station, as many of you know, Art Deco, a wonderful uh, style and, one, and the only station on the uh, tube station on the underground where you can actually see daylight from the platform. But I was fascinated again by the fact that the tube train in the tunnel and the design and everything about it and where the train exits the tunnel mouth there. And I, I long wanted to recreate that in model form. Back in the day, you, some of you might remember this, there was a Dutch guy in the railway modeler, LT modeling a model tube. God, my eyes nearly popped out of my head when I saw this. I thought, wow, someone's done something. And that, that what he'd done there, although pretty crude, at the time, I thought, wow, 
And I, I couldn't do that. I kept that because I thought, look, he's got the scale drawing there of how you can create a tube car out of a bit of cardboard or a bit of brass. Anyway, hold the fault. It wasn't until one year I went to the LT Museum, probably one of the first times, and after going around the museum, walk back through the shop, as you do, and there in the case was this Pucker built 1959 model, double O scale in the glass cabinet. And I, I was staring at it. I was like, like the first time someone seen Tutankhamun or something. It was fascinating. And I said to the girl, there was no price on it. So they always say, don't they? If you don't know, if you don't know, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. So I said to the lady, how much is that? She said, oh, no, no, no. She said, that's not for sale. That's a, a demo. That's a, a display model. I said, well, what is for sale? So she pulled out this box from under the counter and it was one of the old pirate models, etched brass, white metal. I'd never been near any of that in my life. And all I recognized was the cab. So I bought two of them. I bought a driving car and a trailer car. And I thought, right, I've got to have it. I've got to have it. Well, guess what? They sat in the drawer for years. When I looked at the instructions, you can see why they sat in the drawer for years. I hadn't been near white metal or I had no idea. I didn't even have a soldering iron. I had no idea how to put these things together. Got lots of books. And eventually when we moved back in, uh, we moved to our second house, which had a double depth garage in 1995. And I thought, right, I pushed myself. I thought this is the time to make a, a model. And I, I'd been out with friends who'd often done model railway shows with their German layouts. And I got really into the, um, the joys of exhibiting like many of us. And I thought, no, it's got to be an exhibition layout. But of course I was doing it from scratch, not only much of the scenery like um, Mike and um, everyone talks about with the, and the electrics, but it was also, of course, doing underground, which was difficult because, of course, you had your third and fourth row. You had these white metal kits and etch brass kits that I'd never put together before that were pretty ropey in many respects. Anyway, the birth of Mill Ridge, my first layout in 1995, I started that. About, uh, from memory, I think 16 foot long um a free platform station with all through roads and it looked the part and um i hadn't even finished it and our club that i was in at enfield said uh, the exhibition manager said come and exhibit it i said but it's not finished he said no come and exhibit it it was still mud rock and cardboard tunnels and god knows what else but it went down a bomb people were absolutely i was i was so i was amazed and i got into exhibition invites and i hadn't even finished it that was the, the seeds were sown um, it had a, as you can see, it had a pseudo Arnas Grove because that was a station near our school, and I loved Arnas Grove, although it wasn't to scale. And um, Harrow Models White Metal, you can see a lot of it on there. I remember the first one I made up, but not only did I burn a hole in my trousers, and I melted the white metal, so I, I went on a learning curve about low melt solder. I didn't have a clue. And then when it came to soldering them up, well, it was just fun. But you can see there the the makings, how I I started just from not from a plan really it was all in my head and just started to fiddle around with it and i obviously looked at pictures of the underground i made some cardboard tunnel portals you can see there based on the ones at southgate that were common in engineer blue brick around the system and the bridge there you can see on the left at south ealing i used that as a basis for my bridge um and uh, that's how it developed and one way or another you can see there the tunnel at southgate how i mimicked it and how I then got into putting plastic and cutting, cutting in. It, it just developed. It wasn't, it wasn't an exact plan. Um, and again, you've got the tunnel mouth. A friend of mine made the signal as an automatic signal, such that when the train passed, it went to red and the fiddle yard was behind it on a sector plate. And then you reset the signal manually when you had the road ready. So it, it was very simple, DC, nice duet slapped underneath that kept them all running. Um, and it did the trick and it looked the part and we did, quite a few exhibitions with that layout. It was very popular. My basic drawing for the Milbid station and Arnas Grove in reality, top left and um, brick paper, bit of plastic um, and built from scratch. The canopy was a continental style canopy that looked right for the underground. And there in the picture, you can see, um, I think they're all um, pirate models there because the pirate models were etched brass bodies, white metal ends, and they were the they looked good, they were absolute pigs to build, but they looked the part. Whereas the Harrow stuff, the bulk of the Harrow stuff was completely white metal. Dear old Mick did a good job for the time 40 years ago. Some of them, like the Sarah Siddons and the Battery Loco, were very good. 
but others like the 38 stock didn't look anything like the red 38 stock due to the mainly due to the shortcomings of white metal. Um, it featured in the London Underground Railway Society's magazine in December 1999. I was so happy at that. I thought, wow, the layout's been being published, and that was out in the daylight out in the back garden. But they were they were pretty good models. Albeit, I used to put um, Harrow model shop bogies on them because the bogies were useless. They were they were terribly designed and never run properly. People used to say at exhibitions, "How do you get those pirate models to run properly?" Well, I said, "It's simple. You lob the bogies away and use the white metal as weights, and you put Harrow bogies on them, which ran really nicely." And when you compare these models that were obviously forty plus years old now, when you compare them to, uh, they are to scale, and they're, they're the same scale, you know, double O, and exactly the same dimensions as the EFE train. So they were they were pretty good in that respect. So underground news, we had a bit of a uh, feature, very nice feature, and um, we did a lot of exhibitions. I, I can't remember which one this was, but it was one of the big shows, you know, a pucker. It might have been at Wembley when the, um, I think the model railway exhibitions were held at Wembley once and then they shifted to Ali Pali and, you know, Mill Ridge looked pretty good and held its own. There's dear Roger and I in younger days at the, uh, one of our sautés to the LT Museum Depot. Um, we, we, I can't remember, we got an invitation to take the layout to a Route Master bus weekend at the LT Museum Depot. Don't ask me why we should take a model railway layout to a bus weekend, but we did. And we had a hell of a lot of interest. It went very well. And Sam Mullins, who used to be the curator, he came and thanked us and he said, um, he, I said, how has it been? He said, it's been an amazing weekend. It was the first time um, they'd actually opened it up with a theme. And I said to him, well, why don't you have a, make it a model weekend? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I could probably get at the time, I could probably get you a lot of tram layouts, underground layouts, because I knew a fair number of people. And we probably had about 10 or 12 in my mind at the time. I said we could have a, an, an event, from, you know, a model event, and we could combine that with an open weekend. Anyway, I thought he'd just think, forget about it. But a few months later, I had a phone call from a guy who became a good friend who's now retired, a guy called John Riddell. He was one of the curators, and he was given the job of pulling together this weekend. So I went for a meeting. I said, I don't want anything for it. I'm more than happy just to support it and set it up. And whereas they'd had 200 people through for this Routemaster bus weekend, which was probably neither here nor there really when you consider they have to bring toilets in and catering and so on about a year later we did um we did one and um it they had two and a half thousand people queuing up all the way back to acton town tube station in the rain uh, and thereafter every year they were very successful that's my nephew showing my sector plate which slid backwards and forwards it was pivoted it towards the back and on the back left you can see roger's vast range of engineering, LT engineering stock, which many of you will be familiar with, which has grown even further now. Roger's a master of uh, doing all the engineering stock on um, LT. Uh, there was, an, this is a, on the sector plate, I built a depot. This had plaster of Paris um, girders and etched brass like windows. It was the same, is the train shed based on Uxbridge on this station and also at Cot Foster's, but I'd used it as a depot until one day coming down the A1 in a van, the ball fell over and the whole lot smashed to bits. And Roger, bless him, glued it together again with super glue. So it lived another day, but you can see a big crack in that middle pillar there. Now, you might ask, who the hell would think that fiddling around with model railways, you would get to meet a NASA astronaut? Never in my wildest dreams did I think model railways is a solitary, boring bloke's hobby that, you know, it's not social at all, is it? Well, apart from what we do with Lid Rail. Well, I, I think you can probably read that letter there. Back in 2001, I get a call out of the blue from the um, tourist information guy at um, Gloucester. He said, would you like to come to a thing, we're, an, an event we're doing called uh, 2001, a transport odyssey? I can't remember where they found me. He said, we've got a NASA astronaut coming. We've got this, we've got that. I said, yeah, I'd love to. It, we didn't get paid. We had to cover it ourselves, but it was a great day out. It was a one day on a Sunday. And uh, this Don Lind, Dr. Don Lind, he was a, a NASA astronaut. He spent most of his life training and risking his life. He went on Skylab twice. And he was, doing a, he was presenting these amazing slides taken from inside the capsule of the Earth and the sun coming up and the moon and whatever amazing and they had a um record crowds and made record profits and there was a visitor's vote well guess who came first not don lind who rest, rest you know 
for the benefit of mankind have, have risked his life. John Polly comes first with his layout. I thought that it just doesn't add up, does it? There's us having a bit of fun. And I went and congratulated Don Lind on coming second. <laughs> anyway, we had, a, we had a, um, uh, an L London Underground Railway Society event. It was the only one we ever did. And um, again, I helped them pull together all the people we knew who had layouts. And I can't remember the guy's name. And this guy came up from down here in the West somewhere. We had this amazing model that he pulled out of his shed. Hadn't been used for years. I don't know how he got it going. And it had Meccano lifts at either end to lift the trains up from the different levels. And it actually got it working within two hours of the thing. I, I just couldn't believe it. And you can see there he's got guttering or pipes where he's cut them away and he's recreated this strata um, with the old standard stock, the Harrow model standard stock. It was absolutely amazing and the escalator shafts as well. Um, this is a model of, um, this is one of Steve Smith who some of you will know. Steve's a bit of a, a, a bit keen on his A stock, also on the Siglin and look at this amazing double O scale. Look at the detail, the train stop, the shunt, the rail gap indicator, the fog repeater, the full Monty on that signal. What an amazing bit of work. Um, another inspirational modeler. There's one of Steve's um, uh, Harrow, that's um, a Harrow one that's been modified. I think it's a COCP or an R. I'm not an expert on the surface stock, but Alan's, Alan's looking on keenly. Another friend, Tim Stephen, had a wonderful layout called City Road that some of you will remember. Main, again, he used mainly Harrow stock. He had uh, the smoke in the uh, cut and, you know, the cut and cover, he kind of lent, lent itself towards the Bayswater area. Um, another wonderful layout, lots of lights and atmosphere. And there's the arcing of the trains as it went over the uh, gaps, the rail gaps. And there you can see some smoke, very atmospheric and a wonderful layout. And he had his trolley buses on board and um, it, was, it was a lovely layout to operate. Um, sadly, he was broken up, believe it or not, because um, no one wanted to buy it. But I can't believe that. And Tim retrieved the parts off of it. Another friend, um, Jonathan Riddell, lives up in Chesham. Met him at uh, the Chesham show many, many years ago. He was a master of making little resin models in N scale. They were pretty basic, but he had a wonderful um, Dora Park named after his wife, based around the Baker Street area in Chilton Court. And um, you can see there a pretty good representation in two mil of a N scale layout. There you've got Chilton Court and the A stock coming around underneath. <coughs> limited by the chassis and that, of course, because you have to plonk them on the Japanese chassis, Tomix and similar. Another chap I met, again, through exhibitions, had lived in Edgware um, and had a massive uh, loft layout based on Edgware with a train shed. Um, Harrow model stock there again. And then there's one of my trains on the right, the 72 stock and um, areas. <coughs> now, this chap here, long since passed away, bless him, Mark Adlington. Now, we went to a show, I always remember it, in 1999 at Chesham. And uh, it must have been in the winter, I seem to recall, maybe early in the year. And uh, about 4 p.m., about an hour before the show was closing, this chap walks in. And most people, as I think most of you know, when they see a layout, you get seconds, maybe a minute, two minutes if they, they're a bit keener. But if someone spends five minutes or more in front of it, you think, well, either they're a bit of a nutcase or, or we've done something right. Well, this chap kept standing in front of the layout for probably half an hour or so and he eventually came up to me he said and he said you know what I've waited over a year to come and see your layout I saw it in underground news and cut a long story short he was he looked he was effectively a full-time carer for his mother who was in a wheelchair and they lived in a big house just outside Chesham in a little village called Ashley Green he said, at home, I've got a layout that fills a room. I've got Southgate, 55 Broadway. I've got East Finchley. He, list, he went on and on and I thought, this guy's a nutter. So anyway, he said, I live at Ashley Green. And I said, oh, that's on the way, isn't it? He said, would you like to come and see it? So anyway, we all took up on it. And we left the show after we packed that out up in the van. And we followed him through the snow. I remember it was snowing heavily. And then we're down, going down this track this dirt track, and I thought he could have abducted us and steal the layout or something. Anyway, we went in and said hello to his mum in a wheelchair, and then we went upstairs after we'd had a cup of tea and a chat, and I still didn't believe it. I, I, I thought, I, I don't know what to expect. He opened the door, and I felt like Howard Carter when he looked at Tutankhamun's tomb. And this guy, over, oh, I don't know, 10 years or more, had spent his leisure time in between looking after his mum. It was quite sad, really, building this layout, and it was built into this room. It was never going to come out. 
and he built everything apart from the trains and the track everything he built from scrap from plastic from card he was amazing and he took us up there and we were like all of us were like mouth open gobsmacked and there's just an example because he used to be a bus conductor on the old green line out of amersham the last double decker he made a, a, a ball for it and he made some model buses this is an idea of his modeling skills he made these without a drawing just from memory and photos of the buses that he conducted on and he got the paint from the uh, paint shop at Amersham Garage so it was the proper I think it was I don't know what green it was Brunswick green they were all made from cardboard and scrap plastic and you got the license holder absolutely amazing you got the RT the RM or the RMC rather and that RF they were just amazing absolutely you know out of this world there's East Finchley that he built there's a bit more of East Finchley the quality the build quality was amazing absolutely amazing the roof i said how did you get the roof right how did you get up there he said oh i asked one of the drivers on the platform i gave him my camera and they went and took some pictures for me southgate station cut away more southgate with the cross cross passageways fire extinguishers i mean it was you could see how it's all made from scratch you know the detail was absolutely amazing that's uh, 55 Broadway in the background, and Alan will well recommend this from the days at 55 St James's Park. And look at that. That's a third of 55 Broadway made from cardboard and plastic. And Mark, um, I can tell you a story about that. Mark died all oh, some 15 years ago now. And I used to go and see him because he was on a ventilator. I used to go up, he moved to a flat in um, Chesham. And... Um, I always he used to send me a card regularly and he always loved everything LT he was he grew up with LT and he was worried bless him about because he wasn't married he, his mum had died and he had no one apart from a distant auntie he was worried about what was going to happen to his models and he said his words were this isn't good enough to go in a museum I said this needs to go into the LT museum he said no it's not good enough anyway I organized it and they went round there it was all picked up this was before his death because he was on a he was on a time you know he, he was basically knew he was going to die and <coughs> he had lung cancer but they picked it up and they set it up and then they specially went and collected him in a taxi because he couldn't go travel on public transport and they took him down to see it um, when it was at covent garden um, and latterly it's been put into store at the uh, depot but and it said that the, the board that's on there gives the um history of it and um kindly donated to the museum by Mark Adding 2007 so I, I felt that I'd you know done him proud because it otherwise it would have probably have disappeared and there's um, my I office window just there that again that was my office window just there oh, I can just see the bloke sleeping there Alan it must have been you anyway there's Sam Mullins gives you an idea of the scale but it was double four mil to the foot you know and that was a third of Broadway the probably the better side of Broadway and it was clean it wasn't covered in grime like it latterly <clears throat> another guy um and his name has just escaped me he uh, came to one of the acton open days a guy who lived up near Aylesbury somewhere lovely chap only bought this out once this wasn't built to travel but look at the detail on that for an underground layout uh wilsden i think that's wilsden green station in the background near hall lane the detail and he had underground on there as well i think his name was jeff but i can't remember his surname uh, another lovely man, Scrubs Lane. There was a chap called Ron Ron um, Curling, I think his name was. Uh, he had a lot of old RT buses. He was an ex-bus driver. Um, he also had amazing um, LT layout that was around for a number of years and operated by his friends from the Great Yarmouth uh, Model Railway Club. But you can see again the Holden style and the detail. Unfortunately, all these layouts I'm showing you really have, have disappeared now from the exhibition circuit. I don't even know if they're still in existence. This was at its peak. And there's the underground station on the bait on the um, northern line with a harrow model shop 38 stock which doesn't do it for me it just doesn't capture it properly the harrow models version of that certainly the harrow models bobo which has now of course been taken over by the helgen met bobo looks more the part along with the ashbury stock sitting behind it but a lovely model nonetheless there's the harrow model standard stock and Another variation on a theme, there was a guy in the British Association, he used to come to the LT Museum every year, um, and uh, in fact it was one of our revenue inspectors was also involved, 
uh, a chap who lived in Chesham, and there's East Finchley with the driver marching up the spiral staircase and the, two and the 1995 stock in the centre road. A, a great model, but just proving how versatile um, Lego is. This is in the training school. I'm sure many of you would have seen these. These are the, they were the old models on the left, the C stock and so on. And uh, they've now got S stock models uh, on the uh, training school model railway. But you can even see, an, I think that's an A stock up there at the top. So they had a good variety of stock as well. This was Neil Ridge's last outing. Um, we got one of the museum staff to run the last train and shed a tear. And I sold it to a property developer in Bromley for a tidy sum. And uh, he Not just, me, I hasten to say. Again? <laughs> Not me, I hasten to say. No, no, mm. I couldn't believe he bought it. He just took everything off it and wanted to keep the track on the station arrangement. Oh, uh, there you go. Some there we are. are. Well, I always wanted to build something better. You learn from your mistakes, don't you, uh, Mr. Eames? So you, uh, you want to do something new. <laughs> Um, well, we all learn from our mistakes in life and Abbey Road, I had in mind a, a better layout on two levels and Abbey Road proved beyond my wildest dreams to be very, very popular. Um, we did over 100 shows in 10 years with Abbey Road um, and there's a, a postcard that I had with a diorama of the various aspects of Abbey Road. I think it was featured in um, all the magazines, it was on most of the TV channels and in most of the national papers over the years. Um, it was quite spectacular really, just because it was, not because my modelling's better than anyone else's, but it, I think it's, it's so different, so unusual. Um, it started off, I couldn't think of a name, it was going to be uh, Jubilee Gardens, all those names I was thinking of. And I'd started, um, because I realised the pirate models were poor and the, the, the Harrow ones were of their time, I thought, well, I, st I wonder if I can do my own train based on what that Dutch man did and draw it out in etched brass. Um, and I did, with a bit of encouragement from a good friend who worked in etching companies up in the black country. He guided me and that was one of my first trains, a representation of a 92 stock, which wasn't bad for someone who'd never drawn anything in 2D before. Um, and if another friend of mine, you can see in that top left picture, built me he was a, a carpenter joiner he built me some cracking boards and trestles um to, to, as, to form a layout there's a rough diagram of how it might look not to scale but just a, an idea and this was pretty much how it came to be and there we are it is at the lt museum in the year before we completed it <coughs> and there we are it's completed and you can see there the an idea it's very simple in fact it was quite boring as john hall will tell you it's very boring to operate but from a, a viewer point of view, it's absolutely wonderful, which is part, well, it's part of it, isn't it? But, uh, and this is the platforms under construction, the low and high level, a uh, bit of heavy duty engineering there to hold the new platforms down. There's the platforms going down on the two levels and they're my very early etched brass design trains that um, had started to be finished by then. Uh, a 95 stock on the bottom and a central line 92 stock on the top. There's dear Roger in younger days with our fiddle yard um, and you can see there the trains that eventually we um, had made or had made in Sri Lanka. They were re redrawn and um, a friend of a friend in Sri Lanka said you ought to talk to Marno and I didn't realise Marno's previous life skills. He was a, a draftsman and a pretty good engineer in ilk was Marno and he basically took the drawings I had, he, he, he re redrew all of the trains and um, what came out of Sri Lanka was actually truly amazing in terms of the quality and the finish. Um, and to this day, although I've long stopped making them, to this day, they, when they do come up, they're snapped up for very keen prices. But more of that a bit later. Uh, I like the Holden style of buildings um, and uh, this wonderful three millimetre thick plastic card. Um, I used to... Uh, some of you may have, not that you really used it, I hope, unless you're cross-dressers, but uh, there was a chain of lady shops called Evans Outsizes many years ago. They dropped the outsizes because that's not politically correct anymore, so it became known as Evans. And there was a branch in Welling Garden City where we lived, and uh, every morning I'd walk past it, round the back of it, on the way to the station, and in the evening I'd walk round the back of it on the way home again. And what I noticed regularly about every month was that these massive sheets, eight before, six before, massive sheets of this plastic would be leaning against the recycling bin because they couldn't get them in it. And uh, I used to go around there uh, when I saw it in the car, take a standing knife, chop them in half, lob them in the car, and then I'd take them home and 
I had a supply of three millimeter thick plastic, not foam board, plastic. Absolutely amazing stuff. Sand it, you can sand it, cut it, bend it. It's weatherproof, etc. Commonly used on um, building site hoardings. Um, anyway, uh, I start. I kept on doing this, and then eventually I thought, well, I might as well go in and kind of semi-formalise this because I don't know how often they sling it. At, or they have to change it, but they used it for banners in the window. Well, most shops just use a piece of paper or a bit of cardboard, but this stuff must have cost them a packet. So I went in there one day and I said to the lady on the desk, oh, can I speak to the manageress, please? I said, uh, and she came out and I said, she said, can I help you, sir? Thinking I'm buying some lingerie or dress for my wife. And um, I said, yes, I like what you've got in the window. So she said, she looked at me. I said, yes, that plastic. I said, um, how often do you change that plastic? She said, every six weeks. She said, we wonder what was happening to it. What are you doing with it? Because it's got pictures of women on it. And then I said to her, my God, her face, she, I said to her, I use it for my model railway. And she almost sunk and with relief that I wasn't a pervert. Well, a bit odd, you know. Anyway, she said, well, we change it every six weeks. She said, um, I've got no problem. She said, I can give you a bell. She said, but I've got to run it past the area manager first. She said, could you pop back next week? I said, no problem. She said, incidentally, she said, you might make a joke about what we've got in the window. She said, I do get a lot of cross dresses in here and I sell a lot of six of uh, nine to twelve size shoes. I said it's too much information. I said, but I'll have that little red number in the anyway. A week later I went back. She said, Sorry, John, the area manager wants us to send it back to head office. You're not allowed. I said, It's not your fault. She was very apologetic. That was that. Okay, no problem. So thereafter, I went around the back a few more times. There was never any plastic. So I thought, well, that's a shame. I've mucked this system up, haven't I? Roll on a year. That shop had closing down all over it. So I got, let the shop shut down. And a few days later, I thought, I wonder. So I walked around the back. I'm not joking. There was a year's worth of this plastic piled up out the back. So I rang my mate, Jeff, who was a plumber. And we went around in his van. It took us about two hours to cut it all up and put it in the van. Most of it went to our club, which they've still got a big supply of. But it was three mil and five mil. And I'm still going through it to this day, although I'm getting a bit low now. But an ideal modelling medium and for making tunnels, entrances, buildings, uh, platforms, you name it. And you can score it as well to put detail in. So there's how I started to uh, build the Abbey Road um, station. Um, one of Charlie Connor's street level models, cardboard signal cabins, which I modified to the plastic again. And you can see how it turned out there and put um, uh, proper glazing in it. And you can still see there how I created in the same format as my first layout, really, how I started to create the tunnel portals and the retaining walls. And there you can see a finished um, Abbey Road. And uh, that was engineered blue brick from Exacto scale. It used to be printed in Australia and it was slightly embossed. And it, I found it very hard to find engineered blue brick, which, of course, is commonly used on a lot of the, well, on the railways generally. Um, there's one of my own 192 stocks. Um, again, uh, early days. The glass is old carpet underlay. The Hessian back carpet underlay used to get in the old days. Um, I found spraying that with a few old tins of green paint did the trick. I've still got a load of it in the garage because, of course, you won't get that. <laughs> this was the first outing of Abbey Road at Brighton Model World in um, about, um, I can't remember when actually, but that was its first outing. Didn't even have a proper sign and it didn't have a permit lighting but uh, it did the trick and if you look at um if you look at um, the restaurant mcdonald's which is built into the station there um i didn't even have time to finish the interior of the restaurant so the restaurant's got um, opening soon on it and that was the case for about two years until i finally got round to it but we got away no, no trains on it either <laughs> well they never no we didn't run trains john who's talking about anyway oh, i think there's a post that was a post shot. Oh, there we are. There's a train. But that was at the LT Museum. But uh, we did manage to keep trains running backwards and forwards, which, as you know, with exhibitions is what really all that matters. People just want to see things moving. Um, we were at a show, and the amount of people that would come up to us and say, well, if it's Abbey Road, where are the Beatles? Well, quite right. Um, and dear Roger, we were at a show once, and guess what? He found some resin or pewter or white metal Beatles double O scale that one of these local little guys was doing. So Roger painted them up and um, we stuck them on the level crossing. McDonald's had opened by then. And I used the stirring sticks they used to give you in the good old days, the little plastic ones with the M on the end and the McDonald's on the stem to make the McDonald's um, fascia. 
and a part of a car windscreen wiper for the chrome piece at the bottom of the window. Um, I was going to stick some mice on the tables and rats, but I thought I could easily have got sued, so I avoided that. Um, one of Roger's uh, trains in the middle there, a Harrow one, super detailed, as the um, um, the weed, I think the, um, not the weed killer, the, uh, I can't remember what it was there now, but you've got, we've got a variety there. You've got etched brass on the left, one of the central line 92s of my own, white metal in the centre, and one of the EFE trains on the right hand side. Adverts, I used to um, just find adverts and scale them to the right scale and stick them on again using that plastic make advert boards and um, have, because you always need lots of adverts on an underground layout. And there you see the, the effect of the adverts um, and the, the Abbey Road freezes, the typical underground roundels. Um, and the advert there, you can see at bottom right with the elephants on the Millennium Bridge. I, I remember mailing uh, Fuller's asking them if I could have a JPEG to put on my railway and they very kindly agreed because I thought that was a wonderful advert. McDonald's opening soon, uh, the trotters, these were key rings from Marks and Spencers, the trotters and the, um, the taxis, just were number plates added and uh, a couple of buses for good measures. But the amount of people who told us that that bus should never went near Abbey Road, so people like, you know, the detail. There's McDonald's again. Yeah, 93, no yeah. way. <laughs> no way, yeah. Well, I'm not a bus man. Uh, now, at East Finchley, there was the headquarters of McDonald's, at, or the what they call them, Golden Arches at one time, certainly when I was working out of East Finchley. And I recreated that building <laughs> and uh, made it Kingfisher Airlines, which went bust in India, just because I had a pen with Kingfisher on it. And you can see again there, there's some of the other bits that we did in etch brass, the section switch cabinets. And uh, the ton those signals were handmade by Roger, I think it was Roger Murray before he retired. They were proper LT style signals. We had many professional pictures done over the years by a variety of photographers for the magazines. And this was one that they did on the fly because the, the layout was unbolted and you were able to take a picture through the end of one of the boards looking out of the tunnel mouth. And it was quite effective. The guy just charged his arm with it. He didn't even use a tripod because he couldn't. He had to stick the lens into the void. Um, very effective um, and you can see how it looks up towards the station on a gradient and uh, a nice one with the 38 stock trains there and the cable runs. Um, people often ask what well, how was the tunnel we done on the interior? I think this was a crochet mat uh, like a grid where I cut every other lug out of it which took ages but it was better than making it from scratch yourself. Very effective bit of lighting under there, quite atmospheric and some of the trains were modified by um, uh, Jim Stephen with lights um, and he managed to achieve that on the 38s with a, a warm white light which of course was reflected the fact that they had bulbs in them. That's the Waterloo and City Line um, etched glass. These were done in Sri Lanka. That was an absolute pig of a livy to apply. You can you can imagine because you've got those very fine red and blue lines at the bottom there with the skirt of the train. Um, we did quite a few of them and I thought, oh my God, I've got too many Waterloo and City, I'll never get rid of them, but they went like hot capes. They absolutely went like hot capes. We only did one batch of them. Um, we did a standard stock, which never went into production because we spent too long trying to get it right. And then in the middle of the monsoon in Sri Lanka, the only etching machine that we used at a company was flooded out and um, completely destroyed. So we didn't go, go any further with that. The uh, graffiti, I used to go online, print copy and paste um, various uh, bits of graffiti onto a Word document, scale them up or down, and then print them on clear paper to make the graffiti that you can use the walls, etc. Very simple method at the time of creating a flash. It's not exactly rocket science. It wasn't my idea. I can't remember where I gleaned it from. I think a guy called John Ross, who had the was in the whole model railway society and was a southern railway modeler, um, showed me that and it worked a treat. Oh, layout. Um, we actually had the uh, before the um, the Beatles. We did have a level cross, a zebra crossing, and it had um, flashing Belisha beacons on it. Um, and we had one thing that always fascinated people. I had these little uh, pinhole tiny cameras we put in the cabs, and uh, you had a driver's eye view on those screens that we positioned on the layout, which was quite effective as the trains went in and out of tunnels. Uh, ah, we went to Wally. I think we did many shows, but Wally in 2005, I remember, was one of our first um, Abbey Roads outings. 
Um, we were at Golders Green, it seems like years ago now, but 2007, they had the um, 100 years anniversary of Golders Green Depot, and um, we were privileged to be able to attend. And I tried to get a picture of one of my Sri Lankan built and designed uh, 95s up against the real thing, but I couldn't obviously focus the two. We were in the Will Lave shop at the Upminster Open Day, and we all got to drive the um, or control the uh, data robot machine that pulled the cars in and out over the wheel lathe, which was quite fun. Um, that was another fun day. The British Railway modelling, I think that was at Wembley, if I remember right. Um, and we obviously had lots of lots of interest, as I say, it was always quite fascinating. Lots of different audiences, some, not, uh, some uh, alien as well. Many awards. Um, in fact, we, I think in 2007, we went came to Exeter and um, we got the award from the uh, public and then we got the award from the uh, um, club as well. So we, we did very well, again, because it was so different. Um, there's a young John Hall and a young Roger. We're all looking pretty young there. Um, there's the... Uh, we start, We decided we'd build an extension on Abbey Road, an underground... We put an underground bit in so we could have an underground station. Well, uh, I think that was... 2011 I've written on there the new ball um, so we made a lovely board dowels everything and we fitted it in uh, we used um, soil pipe or whatever it was for the tunnels cut them out and um, you can see how it slotted in amongst the existing fully scenic layout and there we are I was going to do a scale version of Arna's Grove with semi-detached houses around it um, and you can see the trains underneath that all happened, but then we realised once we completed it that it looked brilliant and it made the rest of the layout look pretty poor because by then, of course, the layout had been out numerous times and we couldn't bring ourselves to uh, do up the rest of the layout. So we decided that we'd get rid of that and uh, eventually we then decided we'd sell the layout and build a new one. <laughs> There's the London Transport Museum Depot, obviously a bit of Holden style there. And um, we were featured again in various bits of publicity for that over the years. And there's the queue I mentioned earlier. The rate, it was drizzling there, and that was the first open weekend. Look how the queue goes back to the level crossing in front of, our, of Acton Town's tube station. There we all are having a good bit of fun. We like many of the Lidwell crew and that. We travelled around the country, so many places that you would never have gone to. The Angel of the North, I think that was at the mouth of the Tyne. Um, Don, uh, Peterborough or Doncaster, I think it might be Doncaster Racecourse. Um, and Metro Models. I never wanted to do a business, but people kept saying, where do you get your trains from? I said, well, I make them. I said, but where do you get them from? I said, no, I make them. And after a few people asked me initially, I thought, oh, I'll make a few and I'll cover my costs. But I started making a few for people and I absolutely hated it. I realised I could never work on a production line. I loathed it. So I thought, this is a no-no. I don't want to do this. So I, I wasn't, didn't take any more orders. And it was only then through talking to people, I thought, well, what do most people do? Well, they get them made by someone else. Well, there was no point in getting these made here because it would have cost an arm and a leg. And the only, I didn't have any contacts in China, but I had a lot of contacts in India and in Sri Lanka. So initially I started making some in India. Um, this was long before I joined the underground, believe it or not. So I thought, well, let's, I've got some drawings. Some of these were by Piers Connor, um, available through the London Underground Railway Society. Um, I had some Elstone drawings. And so through a friend of a friend in Sri Lanka, he started drawing. And this is some of the stuff he came up with. So detailed, did it all by hand. And um, cut a long story short, we started etching in Sri Lanka. And um, the detail was, was superb. This is some stuff that was done initially here to my drawings. Um, and I used to explain to people the process, um, how people produce etched brass, etched models. Uh, and that was the first one that I did. That These were made in India, actually, in Madras or Chennai, as is now, by a guy who made gates. And this was the 73 stock. And the funny story behind this lot is that photo etch in Birmingham, and this was long before 9-11, supplied me with about, from memory, about 100 sheets of brass, half mil thick each, that formed a, a lump about two and a half inches thick that weighed a tonne. And I took it out to India with me in two, the year 2000, because I was going to go and do an IT course and live there for three months, not knowing anyone who would be able to do anything with it, but knowing that India was probably a better place to get these made up than here. 
Uh, so anyway, cut a long story short, they were made up in India. I came back three months later, but instead of being two and a half inches thick of brass, affected a solid lump of brass, they'd all been put into pairs in boxes. So I had two ginormous outers of 200 train cars. And as I say, this was pre 9-11. You couldn't do that these days. And um, a friend worked, believe it or not, at the airport in um, Chennai. He was the head of catering, but he knew all the customs officers. So when I got to the airport to come home with these two ginormous boxes, I had three trolleys, one luggage trolley with my case on it. These other two had a big box on each of them. And there was a nod at the Indian head nod and the whisk through like a VIP and everything was labelled fragile, be careful, etc., etc. The, the machines were glowing as it all went through with all the metal and everything in it. No questions were asked, loaded onto the plane. And I thought, well, the only fun bit is going to be at Heathrow. So comfortably got home and uh, got to Heathrow at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning, again with three trolleys kind of pushing them like a load of supermarket trolleys in a convoy. And I went for the first time in my life to the Red Channel. I thought it's pointless going green because you can't exactly say it's personal use, can you? So the man I remember had his feet up, reading the paper, a uh, cup of tea, and there was a bell, you rang this bell, and this guy looked, pulled up the screen or whatever and said, yes, can I help you, as if I'd woke, disturbed his pattern of work. I said, yeah, I've got something to declare. He said, what is it? I said, oh, I've just got a few model trains to declare. So he said, have you got a receipt? I said, no, no, I don't have a receipt. I said, I've just had a few put together. He wasn't interested. He said, well, you've got to put the, the commodity code number down. So I studied the books. It was long before it was all put online. And I found a code that represented brass sheet. So I thought, well, that'll do. So I put it on the sheet. I made up a value. I think I quoted him 700 pounds. It was worth a damn sight more than that. And uh, he did his calculator out. He says, uh, that'll be 70 pounds. He said, uh, that and duty. And he said, you can pay by credit card. Thank you very much. So that was it, how they came into the country. Um, in the end, uh, they weren't brilliant, but uh, it was a learning curve. In the end, uh, we had various communications on email, hundreds of communications between Sri Lanka and here. And uh, we got the thing, we got the things perfected. And uh, there we are, there's some of the work that was done in India. You can see how hot it is by Raja Sakran sitting on the floor. Look at the train bodies all being made up, the amount of work that was involved there. And then in Sri Lanka, we did the whole thing again. And you can see in that bottom right hand corner picture, the Waterloo and City cars under, you know, under, under uh, finished painting, the various processes as I think you could all appreciate. And then we even made the boxes out there to my design and um, I effectively imported the trains and fitted the motors and the bogies here. We had various reviews in the model rail press and uh, of course we ran them on the layout. I fitted the wonderful old Tenshodo motor bogies to them and I, when I was in Japan I had the chance to go to the Tenshodo showroom which is in um, Ginza which is like the Mayfair of Tokyo and um, the Tenshodo showroom is a jewellery showroom. You can see by that top right picture the jewellery and brands that are sold there. It's very upmarket but there's a little side entrance and you go up this staircase and there's two floors of Mecca for us model railway enthusiasts. And I remember that there was, there was like typically in Japan, all the model shops, there's hundreds of them in Japan. They're all like jewelers. They're all the men who are in suits. They're all very posh, a lot market. There's none of you old back street shops with the ceiling falling down and cardboard boxes here and there. Absolutely different world. And the market is massive in Japan. And I remember while the guy was digging me out some Tenshoda motor bogies, because I bought what I could while I was there, I saw these other ones. I said, what are they? He said, oh, they're endos. He said, and it nearly killed him because he said, Jack, these are Tenshodo employees. He said, they're better than Tenshodo. And uh, I said, how many of them have you got? And I took half a dozen of them and they were an absolutely amazing bogey, but you, you can't get them anymore. Um, I realised one of the problems with the pirate models and the early kits was the running was very poor. So I reasoned that it was worthwhile spending some money to get the running right. And I was lucky enough to be put in touch with a guy who'd done a bit of model railway injection moulding for a depot in the early days um, down in Kent near Dartford and I went to see him and uh, he was one of these little small scale operations, tool maker, father and son and basically he did this amazing bogey for me. I told him what I wanted because I'm not a, of an engineer in York, I couldn't even prepare a drawing for him and there's a transparent version top right, you can see the design of it with some top hat markets, brass bearings fitted, uh, disc um, disc wheels and on the left you can see the Tenshodo motor he, he then did for me a, what I call a collar 
which was made from the same tool, but it hasn't got the wheel arrangement part in it. So it literally clips onto the axles of a 26 millimeter Tenshodo bogey. And you can see bottom left, how it neatly fits onto it to enable you to fit the side frames to it neatly. And then the bottom right shows you a coupling bar that just sits over the two ginormous hooks on each end of the bogey in those transparent versions. Um, and the running, I think this, I think this will run. Oh yeah, the running is superb. There we are. That's your running as, you know, that's the sort of running you want in model railways, free running. And that's what I'd wanted to achieve at all costs. Um, and that made a hell of a difference. So I became a bit of an international playboy. The uh, finishing assembly was Sri Lanka. The train bodies were done in Chennai. Uh, the motors came from Japan. The bodies uh, in 3D world uh, more recently have come from the Netherlands and Belgium. And uh, a French friend of mine from Paris did a lot of the CAD design in the early days. Um, as I said, I became a driver on the Northern Line in 2002, and uh, that provided me an opportunity to get some first hand measurements of things like the coupler and uh, different elements of the train and detail. This is approaching Edgware on the northbound. Uh, this is a train leaving Edgware, just coming under the road bridge there. And there's my etch brass metro models version of the same. Um, and again, and again, these were on the layout and you can see the various liveries, including that wonderful Waterloo and City livery that uh, existed for a number of years. Um, as I said, the boxes were made in Sri Lanka, all done, uh, all done locally and printing done locally. Um, and even accessories in between making trains, we keep them busy with uh, section switch cabinets and uh, seat stroke signs uh, in these little uh, card hangers. Um, this, I always love these these particular style of seats and signs you get. Some at White City, Arnold's Grove, Hammersmith. So we recreated them in their two different forms with the oval shaped seat and the rectangular seat. The round classic roundels and uh, section switch cabinets. Before I actually joined the underground, you couldn't get near one of these apart from seeing them in the LT Museum. So I measured them and uh, made them in model form. And then also, uh, if anyone wants any BR network rail line side cabinets, just give me a shout. They're going on special offer because we did quite a few of these. Um, they're little etch brass um, models. A bit of road, bit of uh, platform works. They wouldn't do it like this on the underground in reality, but of course you needed to show a hole being dug and uh, people at work. They'd need high vise and protective equipment and uh, they wouldn't be allowed to work in traffic hours, of course, in the real world. Um, people on the layout. Um, Early days, of course, it was model shop. Now, Phil at Radley Models has taken on a lot of the range. It's it's of its time. I mean, it was all you could get back in the uh, 70s and 80s. And Mick, bless him, who smoked like a chimney and sat above the shop at Harrow, he, he batted out a pretty good range of uh, London transport models for the time, but long past its sell-by date, really, now. Um, another friend... Um, um, John, I'm trying to think of his surname now, lives up in the um, Peak District. He's he still to this day does a lot of wonderful LT stations and garages in card. Um, absolutely amazing. And with a bit of modification, putting your own glazing in and putting some plastic roofing and that on, they come up really wonderfully. Uh, as did Charlie Connor of Street Level Models. You had a quite a good range of um, underground inspired models. And there's some of Charlie Connor's cardboard models. He's a master with them. This guy um, was at the LT Museum Depot one year, I can't remember his name, but he had uh, uh, the best collection of the old Ever Ready tube train set, which was the commercial, the first commercially available tube train model that um, Ever Ready uh, introduced. Um, allegedly, the stories behind it were that it, it was in competition with Hornby Double O, but it was quite crude, um, had a Mazak sort of bogey which fell apart over a period of time and a very basic motor and obviously just ran on a, a free rail track with a big wiper in it, like a like the old free rail double O system. Um, but it's very unusual to find sets that ran very well. And this chap was a master of them and a, a real collector. And people kept asking if we had one. So we took one on and um, I built a chassis for it and put some Japanese motor bogies under it and ran it on the layout. And the amount of people, older people, who would say, oh, I had one of them. There we are. Now, we come on to the EFE days. 2002, Frank um, at um, Exclusive First Editions, uh, after being approached by a good friend who was the retail director of the LT Museum, 
uh, was encouraged because he did buses in double O uh, die cast was encouraged by Mike Walton the uh, director of the LT Museum trading and the shop to look at doing underground trains and the two that from a model point of view and a commercial point of view made the greatest uh, the best sort of proposition were the 38 stock which is the one we all remember the red trains introduced um, well just after the war still bodied um, uh, brand you know many new concepts for the time all the underfloor equipment whereas up to then all the traction motors and most of the equipment were behind the cab um, and thereafter the 59 stock the unpainted aluminium trains which were very similar in many ways and certainly in model form could be done using the same tooling so back in 2001 at Duxford EFE used to have a big marquee in the good old days and they they actually sponsored the um, show bus event and there it was there was a porcelain EFE train in a glass cupboard and I like many people went wow look at that you know that was just a representation of what was going to come in the early days of them preparing the tooling and um, lo and behold in um, 2002 Frank then uh, put out what was coming and the first was the northern line top left and these were superb models they weren't powered but they were double o and uh, it said they can be motorized uh, it says in there it'd be an easy task to fit a motorized bogey far from it you need to be able to cut up die cast and uh, think about how you might do it um, but the only advantage was that the body could be unscrewed from the die cast chassis so it was a plastic injection molded body on a die cast chassis with uh, injection molded plastic bogies and you can see there the variants that were done initially based all from the same tool with plugs that enable the cabs to be different and the bogies could obviously be produced differently but the actual bulk of the body on both of those is the same um, and you've got the 38 stock northern line then the central line 59 stock and the at the bottom the Bakerloo line stock and these were the first that were released they were very popular um, initially sold individually um, but that led to a problem because all the collectors bought the driving cars to stick in their cupboard and Frank was left with all the centre cars so then he started doing four car sets but a four car set at the time was 120 pounds quite a lump for the time nearly 20 years ago um, so he was always torn between producing the cars individually and then deciding how many to do um, and until even until they went into administration five years ago he had a large stock of center cars that uh, he couldn't clear off now you can see the level of detail frank was a more a collector's market man than a model railway man um, you had the interior adverts which were unique to the train being produced so if it was central line it had a central line route diagram maps and appropriate adverts and it even had the strap hangers that hang down those black pieces you can see are strap hangers hanging down on the inside you couldn't see all this because of course you had to have the train upside down to even get a chance to see it but it goes to show the level of detail there's an example of the modification you can see the Tenshodo motor bogies as a pair in that one wired together and how much of the interior you had to cut out and of course you could only fit you can only fit these bogey motors because you haven't got room in the body of the <coughs> train to fit a conventional model railway motor bogey and that's the tension the uh, EFE bogey with some rather poor quality steel wheels because of course they weren't built for running and there you can get a, how we modify them uh, and make a new coupling up in brass and metal um, and fit one of my bogies which have been designed some years before that uh, fit very nicely to the EFE. Just give you some examples of some of the EFE models you can, as you, I think you'll agree apart from the handrails on the cab which were moulded which isn't really acceptable nowadays but of course it was related to cost they were pretty good models you know they look they look the part they really did capture um, probably a, a, in, a, in a similar vein to the, the pirate model they really did capture the cab front and the ventilator and the rivet detail of those cabs mm -hmm. and likewise with the 59 stroke 62 stock the detail the finish was was ruddy marvellous um, Frank did make a mistake because obviously you, you milk your models like all the manufacturers do get as much as you can out of a tool um, and he did a red white and blue train there was one red white and blue train done on the northern line as an experiment they they refurbished they, they refurbished it gave it a coat of paint um, but in the end they decided to buy a new train so there was only ever one train but Frank nonetheless did a model of it which which he sold out of so he did okay with that he did the network southeast 38 stock which i think the toothpaste livery which i think was a wonderful model looked very much the part um, and as i say we we illuminated both interior and um 
uh, lighting on the head and tail lamps, which is quite a task, especially when you've got to drill those tail lamps into the die cast chassis. And this was all done by Tim Stephen, who to this day is a master of lighting up uh, models that don't have lights. I fiddled around with some uh, Network Southeast cars in the early days and some of Rad Phil Radley's uh, old bodies I had that had turned, that had gone banana shaped because they'd been, uh, the resin had gone a bit funny. So I chopped the cabs off and uh, converted some 38 stock driving cars into the Streamliner. Did a number for retirements over the years on plimps. Um, and EFE also released seats and uh, escalators not working, molded. I mentioned Roger earlier. There's a young Roger. Um, some of Roger's amazing range of engineering stock. Roger uh, had a good arrangement with Harrow Model Shop to get bits off Norman and uh, up, go upstairs to Mick and take bogies and bits and pieces off him. And uh, a lot of this, the elements of it, including you can see at the back there, the gauging car, Roger has scratch built. But uh, he's got an impressive collection. Uh, there's another one of Roger's uh, ballast motor wagons on the layout. Some of his battery locomotives. Um, all modelled faithfully on the original loco and any graffiti that was there, model, Roger would add. Um, but in impressive range. And when we were doing exhibitions, we went way over the top with engineering stock because you wouldn't see that in, in service hours. We were running them sometimes every other train. But again, it just gives interest. It's our layout. And uh, Mark Rogers got some uh, Toxo 2 uh, graffiti on there. And you can see the Shoma locos. An amazing range. We had we had an amazing range of stock. Far too much, in fact, to really run on the layout. But that we're all guilty of that. We managed to do the Shoma in 3D. We managed to get a very basic drawing of the Shoma diesels. Roger had scratch built some, um, but we managed to do uh, 3D printed ones, which came up uh, pretty nicely. Those have all now been converted to. Um, uh, well, not all of them, I don't think, but some of them, I think, are being converted to um, battery uh, rather than being diesels. Um, that's Roger's version of the dinosaur, an old Harrow Models train before um, EFE released their own one. And that Roger's hand painted that. Pretty impressive. Uh, the asset inspection train that never actually went into use. I think this went to Germany to be by Schwebau. Um, had cameras and all sorts of things fitted to it, but it never went into use. But we did run it on Abbey Road. Um, had exhaust ports on it because they had a generator in one of the cars. Uh, the weed killer, the classic old weed killer, the converted 38, and Roger had faithfully recreated the pipe work on the front and the effect of the weed killer on the front cab. The asset inspection train based on a 72 stock, another train that never ran on the underground but ran on Abbey Road. You can see how Roger's modified it and filled in windows, etc., again in line with the prototype. We couldn't run surface stock on Abbey Road because it would not go in the tunnel. Um, but we did have a little bit of fun sometimes and Roger had repainted some Class 66 in the wonderful Metronet livery day. So we'd have a little fiddle before show started. And there's an example of what some of Roger's handiwork. Um, bit of messing about. There's a two millimetre version of the Metronet 66 alongside a two four millimetre versions there. Ballast wagons of Roger's again. And good dose of graffiti. What would the underground be without graffiti? Much better. Much better, yeah. <laughs> um, now, as I mentioned, one of the things that uh, I, it's one of probably the failings that I look back on really was a, like most, that's a wonderful train, you know, the design of the standard stock, although it varied a bit over the years, but the standard stock was in production for what, from about 1923 till 1934. Uh, it was standard in some ways, but there were so many variations to it. But it had that lovely cloistry roof with the scoop vents and so on. And I long wanted to do a model of it because the Harrow one in white metal just didn't do it for me. And um, the blessing, the gang in Sri Lanka took this on, but it was it was forever in development. And then, of course, it went wrong when we lost the etching machine. Um, so I dug up drawings. A good friend of mine, Brown Hardy, who Alan will know well, who's done very Mr. Rolling Stock of the Underground. And... We did a hell of a lot of work in Sri Lanka. You can see there the detail that went into a two millimeter model on the different parts. The roof was made in different parts, the cab ends, the rear ends to reflect the different the variations. And we had hundreds of emails back and forth, lots of pictures of the detail. Um, like we've been talking early with some of the sessions when you know doing the CAD drawing, just getting that detail right. And look at the detail, for example, in that bottom right hand corner at the end of a you know a four millimeter scale car you know that the handrails the connecting 
pipes, etc. And the doors, you know, we, we really were, we were we are moving it on. And there we are, there's some cars under production in Sri Lanka. You can see how we managed to keep to the scoop vents and the detail of that roof and to overlay that secondary roof on the main body was quite something. You can see the amount of solder that's gone in there and rubbing down. And the net result, I mean, that, you know, they were, they would, we did a few, we never sold any because the, the, the they were, they were still flawed, but the ones we did get to run, absolutely amazing. And to this day, people are, where did you get them from? You know, a wonderful model. I know that's too pristine, but the actual, it does capture it. It really does capture it. And there you can see one next to the EFE 38. It doesn't look at all out of place for a model that's been built by hand rather than a, an, you know, a, a mass produced model. Um, there's a control trailer where the driver would drive the train from the other end to the uh, driving motor car. And I even got to the stage we designed a wonderful box and a certificate. I was going to go the Hornby route, you know, sell them at a higher price and just do a limited number of them. I don't think I ever decided how many we were going to do, but that was quality. And it was such a shame that we never got there. Anyway, that's life. Um, 3D, we, I know we've had a lot about 3D today, but when I early, quite early on, I realized that 3D might be the answer to be able to create things. And um, I thought, well, why not try the 09 stock? I quite like that for a modern train. I don't normally like modern, probably like a lot of you, but I, I quite like that. So uh, a good friend who came out with a lot of French chap who is a master, um, a bit like I've seen today, you know, he, he was using SketchUp and was able, because I, I gave him the drawings, he was able to come up with some excellent 3D representations. And there's an early one of the 09 stock um, and uh, one of the early finished ones, again, next to an EFE 38 stock. They didn't come up too bad. It's got shortcomings, it's too glossy, etc. And you've got that, uh, um, the, the finish isn't brilliant. Um, just as an aside, I managed one year, we went to Ali Pali to the exhibition there, the model exhibition, and the Model Railway Club had their usual range of second-hand tables. And I had a quick glance, and I never normally bought much because I was too much into the underground. I got to the last table and my eyes nearly popped out of my head. There was five four-car sets, etch brass O-gauge of underground and surface stock trains. And I thought, wow, and I couldn't wait to get someone. And I said, how much for the whole lot? The man said, you want the whole lot? He said, hang on a minute. He said, I've got the guy here who picked them up from the guy, the guy, a member of ours died, uh, um, has died now. Sorry, a member of ours made them all from scratch and he, he's donated them to the club because he's now in a wheelchair and he can't use them. So anyway, I, I basically did a deal and bought them all. And um, I had to go and pick them up from the Model Railway Club in a taxi a week later because I didn't have enough money on me because it was all cash on that club stand. And um, I went to see the guy who made these. He was a retired computer engineer, lived in... Um, up in um, the Cotswold somewhere. And they, I went around there and they did me a Sunday dinner and bless him, he was in a wheelchair, but he built these for a layout that he built for his retirement. And he only took it out once. It had all Dexian and God knows what else. It was a nightmare, he said, to put up. But of course, then he, he'd had a stroke and um, that was the end of that. And he wanted the trains to go to a good home. So I took them off his hands, shall we say, and he gave me the original drawings, not that they were much good to me because it was all done by hand, but they were they were lacking in some regards. I think the standard stock had a Lima motor bogies in it, but the uh, the seat, the, I think that's an R stock behind it. They were, there was a T stock and a 38 stock. They were quite amazing for someone who'd never had any experience of making a model in etched brass before. Now, one of my customers, bless him, early days, he had a plate rack, he wanted to put a train round. So he ran this train, I think it ran on a timer or something, ran round his uh, kitchen. Each to their own, I say. Um, I meet, you meet all sorts of people. I met the astronaut, this guy, Neil White. He used to be the CEO of Alstom Power Transmission Systems. He, was a, he, was, he ran half the world, basically, for that company. Mad about the underground. And uh, I met him through um, exhibitions and things, and he, he bought a lot of stuff over the years. He said, I've got an underground train. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've got a proper underground train, another one you think is mad. He bought this from the scrap man because LT wouldn't sell him the train because of the asbestos issue. And uh, he had to prove that he was credible. He said the train cost relative nothing, but the actual transportation from uh, the scrapyard to his home up in uh, Northamptonshire and uh, he plays in a jazz band so uh, he has his jazz band practice in there and uh, he's connected a, a compressor to it converted a lot of it to 240 volts um, so he can open and close the doors you've got the 
the doors close visual on the, the guards panel works and um, you can have a bit of fun. Uh, we were featured in many magazines. There we are, British Railway Modelling, Hornby Magazine, uh, good old uh, London Underground Revenue Magazine. I was even standing on the platform for that one, waiting for one of my own trains. Uh, we were in the Tube series on the telly. That was quite fun. And um, various other bits and pieces over the years. Um, one of the best ones, which was following our appearance on the uh, television, I had a phone call from the Metro um, in uh, London and they said, oh, we'd like to do a feature. And uh, I couldn't, you couldn't make it up. This was in 2010. I got the full spread on the centre pages in colour. Uh, it was a Monday, which is a dead news day generally. And the only other thing that happened that day, I remember, was Julian Assange was arrested or, or ran into the embassy. Um, and I remember standing on the train going to work and watching people in the train car, especially this lady in a burqa. And I thought, when she gets to the centre of that paper, I reckon she's just going to flick over because this is all boring. Everyone in that train car, because it was very easy to see when people got to the centre pages, they stopped. And, and I was amazed. I felt, I felt really strange. I thought, wow, you know, they're reading about my train set. And people were absolutely fascinated by it. Quite amazing. I was mentioned in a book. Someone said, you know, you've been mentioned in a book. And he talks about the uh, Evans Outsizes exercise and the, you know, the uh, um, cross-dressers. He picked up on that. So he must have seen me at a presentation. And um, if this will work, we had a feature on ITV News. A London underground without strikes, without delays, and without congestion. Impossible. Or so you might think, but John Perry has created one in his home. At 20 feet long, when he and Ken Powell Bowman have set it up, it takes up most of the house. His pride and joy took over two years to build. There we are. Um, I always thank all my operators over the years, even Mr. Hall, who said it's boring and uh, often comments rather than operates. But there we have a very rare sight of Mr. Hall actually doing something on the layout. Uh, very young Howard and a young Roger. Um, and uh, some of the fun no, we've had no, over the years. found a you operating, John. No, it's not known. I don't operate. I just do the, I do the customer liaison, John. And uh, yeah, we are. We've had some fun. We've been attacked by Daleks. We've been all over the country. And I always remember my Sri Lanka gang. There they are, uh, five of them. There's Mano, my great friend of mine in the centre there. Um, and uh, the two girls, one of the girls, Ramya, she was a nurse. Um, was out of work and the other girl worked in a garment factory and it changed their lives because I used to pay them all in sterling and um, they were a great little team I'm still in touch with several of them now but certainly with Manu he's getting on a bit now but they put they without them it would never have happened so uh, quite an amazing thing and um, just to close <laughs> John Perry was a driver himself until he gave it up for the best job of network control. I enjoyed it, and I do miss it in a, in a funny sort of way, but at least I've got my uh, little trains to play with instead now, and they're much less trouble. I wouldn't have told the company, but I'd probably spent a lot of my time driving on the Northern Line for free. <laughs> There we are. There you have it. I hope you all kept awake. I hope you enjoyed it.
John, that was Thank fantastic. You. Very good, Joss. Thank you. You're very welcome. As I said before, young. as I said before, my first love, anything London transport, trams, trolleys, underground. And if I hadn't found a very easy way to park, to, to make Southern EMUs, I would have been building underground stock. Ah, ah. Um, and I've remained an underground fan for ever. Oh, oh, I've got that one. I've got the East, I've got it, I've got the same one, Dave. Because that's okay. where I was based, East Finchley. I've been cutting down my collection recently, so I sold Ali Pally. Oh. Yeah, um, loads of money. <laughs> I bet you did. They don't, yeah, there. Uh, I'll just share something. Uh, oh, bloody hell, it's gone. Um, <laughs> No, it's, uh, yeah, in a minute I'll do it. It's coming. Forget that. I've got to go and find it. So someone else is welcome to, oh, here we go. Does that work? Uh, not sure. Hold on. Uh, yeah, you've got a picture up. Oh, you're back again, guys. Okay. Hi, Carl. Dinner was ready. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, I've lost it now. Forget it. <laughs> well, there's one wrong. You had one picture there. Oh. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, Acton Town and Shoreditch. Hey. Wow. Whoa. Well. We out. think the sign behind me, um, Roger's got that down to one or two platforms somewhere at the south end of the northern oh, line. The white one. Yeah. And then until I get a full size Acton Town, Whoa. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got a, a full size Axbridge. Showing off now. Fantastic. Very nice. And in fact, right. above the doorway in my workshop, can we get that? I can't quite see it. And that's wave at you. Tickets. Yeah. 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 You've done well, John boy. Yeah. If it's not right. melted down, yeah. You're muted, John. Are we back? Oops. You're back. Yeah. Don't forget burgled, yeah. they're going to get whacked around the head with that, which is, I think, ex vep or possibly rep. Oh, wow. Right. Uh, I'm going to. Um, I probably ran over time, didn't I? Oh, no, it's into meal break. Yeah, um, you went a bit late. It's into meal break. We want to eat, geezer. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to I'm gonna leave you then. I'm going to have this. You've done very well, John. So I just, I just went then. I just, I didn't you just me. launched, didn't you? Uh, yeah, thank you. That was very good. You're very welcome. Uh, I'll probably, I'll see. Hopefully, see you later if we don't get drunk yeah. at the night. One of the neighbours. If not, I'll see you all tomorrow. Yeah, good, look forward to that, mate. Cheers. Cheers, John. Bye, bye, everyone.